university here has done, has done lots of things at various scales and uh, I thought the talk on, on biodiversity would probably fit more with the interest of everybody rather than a more specific talk on stomatic behavior and things like that. So uh, the floor is yours for the Thank you very much, Maurizio. Uh, thank you for inviting me here to give this, uh, this talk. Um, first of all, I must say I am not a community ecologist. As uh, Maurizio explained, my background is in theoretical physics. Um, but what I want to try to show you today is how ideas and tools from physics can be used to gain insights into patterns of biodiversity. And, um, in doing so, I do not expect you to be, know anything about physics, in fact, because the uh, ideas and concepts I'm talking about are actually quite um, familiar to you. They are the, the laws of probability, the laws of chance, um, and I should hope to try to explain to you how the laws of chance can give us insights into patterns of biodiversity. Okay. Um, so, broadly speaking, my understanding of community ecology is that it's concerned with some very fundamental questions of uh, the rules of assembly of, of ecological communities. What are the key factors that determine uh, how many species there are in a given ecosystem and what the species abundances are? Um, a second fundamental question is, what is the relationship between the productivity of an ecological community and its diversity? Are more diverse communities more productive or less productive? Um, and uh, a third relationship I want to talk about today is, uh, and a challenge for community ecologists, is to understand the relationships between the diversity of an ecological community and its stability which is a long-standing question in um, community ecology. So these are the, the three basic sort of fundamental questions I want to t discuss today um, and hope to convince you that some ideas from uh, physics and uh, probability can give us some insights into these basic uh, questions. So before going further, I want to just illustrate what I mean by each of these three challenges for community ecology. So firstly, um, to take a specific example, in uh, tropical savannas, they are a mixture of, of different uh, species of uh, trees and grasses, typically. And as one goes from very arid sites on the top left, that's an Australian savanna, uh, through to semi-arid and then wet uh, uh, savannas, we go through a transition from ecosystems dominated by short vegetation and lots of bare ground through to species um, communities which uh, have a coexistence of trees and grass through to systems which are dominated by by trees tropical forests so the question is what explains that transition through from arid to wet um, mixtures um, that's the first question um, the second question relates to the relationship between uh, the productivity and diversity of ecosystems. And here the picture seems to be more diverse, if you like. There are two broadly uh, contrasting patterns uh, one observes. In, on the left-hand side, we look at some laboratory experiments. You throw some mixture of species together and we look at how the diversity of species, the number of species in the community, um, depends on, in this case, the nutri nutrient concentration. We're talking about bacteria here. And the pattern here is that at either very low nutrient concentration, low fertility, or at very high fertility, diversity is very low. That's to say that the ecological community, in this case bacteria, are dominated by a few species. But at intermediate um, uh, nutrient concentrations, there is a, a, a maximum in the diversity. So we call this a unimodal pattern of diversity uh, versus productivity or um, resource availability. Um, but in contrast, if one looks uh, on larger scales, like continental scales, uh, for example, just considering the species diversity of plants as you go from polar regions through to equatorial regions, the general pattern is that um, as you increase the availability of the limiting resource, um, you get more species. Diversity increases monotonically 
um, with uh, resource use. And so there's these two contrasting patterns. How can we explain uh, both of these uh, patterns uh, within a single um, framework? Um, the third pattern, which I talked about at the introduction, is the relationship between the diversity and stability uh, of an ecosystem. And there again, we have two contrasting patterns. Um, on the left is a graph showing on the horizontal axis the number of species in a community, um, in a plant community in this case. And on the y-axis is a measure of how variable the biomass of a given species within that community is. So not the entire community, but one species, one component. And although there's a lot of noise there, the general trend is um, a, a somewhat gradual increase in the instability uh, with the species richness. So um, the variability of a given species within a community um, becomes larger the, the more species it's competing with. Um, so diversity makes an individual species more unstable. In contrast, on the right-hand side, if one considers the stability of the community as a whole, considering the biomass of all the species added together, then if we con concentrate on the solid, uh, solid black line there and the black triangles, for an instance, the general trend, apart from the end, is that the variance of the total community biomass declines with species richness. That's to say that the community becomes more stable with, uh, as you add species. So these two contrasting uh, patterns, one at the species scale, one at the community scale. And again, the question is, how can we explain and reconcile these two contrasting patterns in the relationship between diversity and stability? And I guess the the message here is that uh, with, with all these different contrasting patterns, there have been uh, particular explanations offered by ecologists as to uh, why this species exists, uh, uh, why this pattern exists, uh, um, and other arguments uh, for, for the other patterns. But what is lacking is an, an overall explanation which can uh, explain and synthesize all of these contrasting patterns with a, within a single theoretical framework. And this is what I want to try to convince you today that um, some of the ideas from, from probability and physics can help us to s explain and synthesize these contrasting patterns. <coughs> so we have these, um, the challenge is we have a diversity of patterns of diversity, if you understand me. And uh, is, there a, is there a common explanation, a common theory to, um, to explain all of these uh, patterns? Um, one approach um, is to try to simulate through dynamic simulations the, the complexity of, of, of ecosystems in terms of the in individual interactions between organisms, uh, uh, between species, uh, and very quickly one, one gets uh, to a very complicated picture um, of uh, interactions between different individuals. Um, the characteristic of these types of models is that there are many, many parameters. They're parameter rich, uh, the interaction strengths, for example, between different individuals. Um, and they are difficult to, to measure uh, empirically. Um, so we have many unknown parameters. And um, while these models can be very useful and can be parameterized for particular sites and particular systems where one has sufficient data, they are very difficult to generalize across other sites where one does not have sufficient data. So there is a, a limitation to uh, how uh, general the insights from these very complex models uh, can be in explaining those diverse patterns. So I don't want to say anything more about that approach. Um, I want to contrast that with uh, an approach much simpler approach actually based on the laws of probability and so this talk is essentially going to be on uh, two themes one theme based on the idea of chance and the other the idea of necessity 
and I will explain to you what I mean by chance and necessity and how these two concepts can be uh, combined to explain this diversity of patterns. So first of all, chance. Um, the idea here is that perhaps the, these emergent patterns of diversity that I talked about in the introduction are somehow representative of the, 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 the most probable behavior of a, a very complex system. Uh, the analogy I would like to give is that you're all familiar with is when you toss a coin and the result is heads or tails. How do you say in Spanish or Catalan? Okay, good. <laughs> I'll still use heads and tails if that's okay. Uh, so we uh, need to know an immense amount of mechanistic detail in order to predict the outcome of one throw. We need to know how fast we move our thumb, what the wind, the density of the air is, um, the angle at which the coin uh, hits the surface of the table and uh, the, the, the detailed physics, uh, the res resilience of the table surface, um, physics uh, details that we simply do not have. Um, in contrast, if I uh, toss a coin a thousand times, I can say with almost 100% certainty that the most probable mixture will be what? 50-50. Okay. So I can say something very certain about the frequency distribution of heads and tails, but I can say absolutely nothing about the outcome of one throw. So this is the idea I want to introduce that with ecology, perhaps we can say something quite certain about the broad average patterns that we see in ecology. Um, but in order to predict uh, very site-specific um, properties of, a, of an ecosystem, that requires a lot more information. So I'm going to step back and try to ask a simpler question about the average behavior of ecosystems and the frequencies of ecosystem properties. And um, the idea is that like coin tossing, more can be simpler in that the behavior of a long series of coin tosses uh, produces represent reproducible behavior um, in contrast to a single. So in, the, in that long run of coin tosses, the 50-50 uh, concept becomes the most probable behavior. And we can essentially ignore the particular mechanistic details that govern each throw and treat them as random noise. That's the idea. Okay. Uh, this, this idea is, is very simple uh, and in fact was exploited um, more than a hundred years ago by uh, physicists, physicists during the development of what's known as statistical physics, but it's a statistical probabilistic based um, picture of um, the behavior of a large number of molecules, like the, the air in this room for example. And the key point that I want to get you to understand from this is that the um, goal of these, uh, this approach was not to predict the um, particular microscopic state of all the molecules in the box, the positions and velocities. That would be like trying to predict the outcome of a single toy, uh, coin toss. Rather, they were in, more interested in the frequency distribution of possibilities, like the 50-50 frequency distribution. So we replace the question, we make it simpler, say let's not try to uh, predict the microscopic dynamics um, explicitly, but just the probability that the system will be in a particular state. Um, and the idea is that um, we try to construct this probability distribution knowing that there are certain constraints that prevent some possibilities happening. For example, the, all the molecules must be in this box it can't be outside the box. So this is like you introduce constraints and the idea would be like perhaps uh, instead of tossing a fair coin where there's equal probability of heads and tails, one might have a constraint where heads are more probable than tails. Certain outcomes are more probable than others when we have constraints. Um, but the idea is that apart from those constraints we treat the microscopic details as essentially random noise. Um, the idea of applying those probabilistic um, concepts, the laws of chance, to ecology is actually a very old one. It goes back to uh, uh, Lotka here. And he uh, had this vision 
that in the same way that uh, the physicists were looking at the collective behavior of atoms and molecules uh, in a box, um, you could perhaps consider individuals in an ecological community as atoms and look at their average behavior in the community. So this analogy between atoms and, and individuals and in the same way that one can derive in physics some very simple emergent behavior like the, the simple relationship between the pressure, the volume and the temperature of this room, for example, um, without knowing the detailed microscopic state of the system, one could perhaps also derive and understand the emergent large-scale behavior of ecosystems without delving into the individual uh, dynamics. Um, that was a vision, essentially. Um, unfortunately, Lotka did not actually realize that vision. He didn't carry it through. Um, it was just a passing sort of dream. Um, however, um, what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the, this talk is um, how um, recent work by, by my group and others uh, worldwide have retaken this, readopted this vision of Lotka and um, try to uh, carry, carry it through. Okay, so let's go back to basics. Let's go back to school and uh, coin tossing. Um, because the logic, if you understand the logic of this, you'll understand what I'm going, going to talk about for ecosystems. You toss a coin two times. There are four possible individual sequences. There's heads, 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 tails, tails, heads, and tails, tails. Four sequences. But the two of those sequences have an equal mix of heads and tails, the 50-50 and the, the heads, heads, there's only one of those, and tails, tails, there's only one of those. So already you see that the 50-50 mix of heads and tails is more probable than any other, because there are more sequences that produce that. Now go to four throws, and there are six individual sequences which produce a 50-50 mixture of heads and tails. That again is the more probable frequency distribution of heads and tails because it can be realized by more individual sequences than any other mixture of heads and tails. So you see the pattern that's emerging is that the, the more throws, the more probable the 50-50 mixture comes up. Um, so if you look at the four throws, we can create a histogram of the number of heads um, and we see there are uh, six individual sequences that produce two heads and therefore two tails in a sequence of four throws. And we can see that, represent that as a probability distribution um, in the middle there, where the heads and tails have equal probability, 50-50. So you see that the most probable mixture of heads and tails is also the most uniform frequency distribution uh, with this 50-50 mixture. And we see this pattern that's the, the statement there. The 50-50 the distribution is the most likely. It's also the most diverse, the most uniform. Um, so we're introducing the idea that diversity is somehow linked to probability. Um, we look at eight throws and we see that the 50-50 mixture, that's four heads and four tails, becomes much more probable than any other. We look at 16 and 32 and you see the distribution peaking at the 50-50 distribution, and as I go through a thousand throws or a million throws, um, most, the overwhelming majority of sequences have a 50-50 mixture of heads and tails, and very few have any other. So you see that um, as you look at the, lo the, the long-term statistics, this pattern becomes dominant. Um, so. Um, one way that we can uh, put this into, we can generalize, generalize this idea of, of coin tossing is to think of um, rolling a dice where there are maybe six outcomes now instead of two outcomes. And in general, we can count the frequency distribution of uh, given outcomes just by counting how many times that particular outcome uh, is observed in a long sample. And uh, we can introduce the, the frequency distribution that, which is that, that ratio, Ni over big N, and associated with that frequency distribution of outcomes in a long sample is uh, something called the Shannon entropy of that frequency distribution, which is nothing other than a measure of how spread out that distribution is. 
So you see the 50-50 thing will be spread out the, the maximum. And the connection with probability theory is that the Shannon entropy is, although it's got a fancy name, is nothing more than a logarithmic measure of the number of ways of realizing that particular frequency distribution. So the 50-50 distribution is, um, has got the greatest number of sequences. Um, that's a useful mathematical um, generalization which allows us to um, generalize and apply the concepts of probability theory to, to ecology. And, and here it is just in this simple example. I'm plotting the Shannon entropy of the probability distribution of heads versus tails as I look at the um, case where the frequency of heads is zero going up to one and I see that in a long sequence of throws the 50-50 distribution has the largest Shannon entropy that's simply because it's a, a measure of how uh, often I can realize that 50-50. So the, the key concept here is that the Shannon entropy is a measure of the probability of a given frequency distribution and the maximum probability is associated with the maximum diversity and that's the same as the maximum uh, entropy. So um, the idea is that um, maximum diversity uh, you would expect to observe um, diverse uh, system diverse ecological communities because perhaps they are the most probable in the in the sense of, of coin tossing and we'll see how that works um, so that's the idea that um, we're looking at nothing more than uh, coin tossing and, and the number of ways you can realize different frequency distributions um, the second um, concept that I'm going to introduce is the idea of necessity um, in that there are certain constraints on the possibilities which bias um, the distribution in one way or another. And in, in the ecological context we can envisage some very basic constraints on the assembly of communities that um, whatever the mixture of species in a community in the long term the community must respect mass balance. You can't um, create mass from nothing. So um, all these systems uh, obey the, the laws of mass conservation <laughs> and energy conservation and there are constraints on ecosystems such that the for example the available space. So there, there are very sort of general generic uh, constraints on how communities can be built up. Uh, they have to be the, obey these, these very general constraints. Um, so these are the, that's the, the, the key idea I want you to, to to get into there that there are some some basic constraints on the rules for assembling communities. Um, so how do we put these two concepts together to gain insights into ecological communities? We want to combine the laws of chance on the one hand which tell us how likely a given frequency distribution of outcomes is and on the other hand we want to take into account that not all outcomes are equally probable. Uh, that in fact in ecology we're always tossing a biased coin. Uh, how we do this is that um, it gets back to our original question, what are the key determinants that um, uh, determine the species abundances of communities? Well, we'll guess, okay, we'll guess that perhaps water availability is a key determinant of certain uh, species abundances. Um, we, we take a, a guess for our constraints and then we use the maximum Shannon entropy which is just simply giving us the most likely frequency distribution of outcomes as our way of predicting uh, the probability given those constraints. So that gives us the most likely uh, distribution and then we compare that predicted frequency distribution of out ecological outcomes against observations. And the idea is if uh, the predicted frequency distribution uh, coincides with the observed distribution, then we have identified what the key determinants of that frequency distribution uh, are. And the idea being that then all the other mechanistic details that one could envisage, like individual interactions between organisms, can essentially be treated as random noise um, in the same way that one can successfully predict that 50-50 distribution of heads and tails uh, will emerge as the most likely outcome of tossing uh, an unbiased coin 
um, many times. And if, when, if in the same way that if you observe that in fact the observed frequency distribution of heads and tails is 60-40, then you know you've got a missing constraint there. It's a signal you've missed a constraint. So we're just using exactly the same logic of uh, coin tossing as um, we, when we apply this to ecology. So that's the, uh, the, the overall out, um, uh, look of how to um, use the ideas of chance and necessity to pre um, tackle the, explain these, these different um, patterns. So now for the remainder of the talk, I'm just going to talk you through how we actually applied uh, these ideas to answer these particular questions here that I introduced it in, earlier in the talk. Um, so the key determinants of species abundances, um, here the challenge was to explain uh, the transition from uh, species, uh, low diversity species dominated by scrub and bare ground essentially to mixtures of trees and grass to dominance by trees in tropical savannas. Now the, the classical um, paradigm for, for explaining this is to invoke um, on the one hand water availability so this is rain annual, mean annual rainfall on the horizontal axis and what is uh, plotted on the vertical axis is the observed uh, tree cover fraction of different savanna sites. So each of these dots is a particular savanna site and um, what you see is that for any given mean annual rainfall there's enormous variability in the fractional tree cover uh, that you observe but there's a general trend um, from low tree cover to high tree cover as you increase water availability and the classical explanation for the variability is that um, ordinarily with an undisturbed um, uh, system uh, at large water availability the system would be dominated by, by trees but we due to fire herbivory and other disturbances um, we get this um, variability um, uh, observed in, in the distribution. So um, the challenge then is how uh, can, can, we, um, can we explain this, this pattern in, in, in simpler terms without having to model explicitly all those um, details like fire and herbivory. So this is what we tried to, to do here. So we recall the coin tossing analogy in coin tossing the outcome is either heads or tails and we're interested in constructing the frequency distribution of those outcomes, the probability that in a long uh, sequence of uh, throws we get um, say 50% heads, 50% tails. So there's a sample frequency distribution. And the, the analogy then is that instead of coin tosses we have the observation of, a, of an individual savanna site and the outcomes uh, are then the actual fractional covers of trees versus grasses, for example. So like uh, an outcome could be that uh, for this particular savanna site, the 60% uh, ground cover by trees, 30% ground cover by grasses, and 10% by bare ground. So that's like an outcome of a analogous of a, of a, a toss of a coin. And we are interested in predicting the frequency distribution of those outcomes across many different sites in the same way as we do for the probability of heads and tails in a long sequence of um, throws. So that's the analogy and from then on it's just a case of applying the same laws of chance and necessity to uh, predict that frequency distribution. Um, so here is how we did it. We assumed that our savanna site could be um, divided up into small patches of the, uh, the size of, of a typical individual plant and each cell or each patch could be occupied by either a tree or a grass or bare ground. And um, we assumed that um, trees are thirstier individually than grasses and grasses are thirstier than bare ground. In other words, there's a hierarchy of water use at the individual level between these three different cover types. And um, in the uh, uh, in defining what the key constraints of this uh, uh, savanna model would be, we considered uh, a particular area constraint, that, that's to say we're considering a certain number of, of patches in a system that defines the, the physical extent. 
And then the other constraint we assumed was that this system is um, essentially governed by how much water is available. And the key constraint there is the balance, the long-term balance between the water availabil availability, the water input to the community from, from rainfall essentially, and the amount of water that the um, community uses in terms of uh, evapotranspiration. In the long term, the, the average water use by the community should balance the average water available to that community. It's a basic ecological uh, mass balance constraint. And the mean annual community water use we just uh, quantified as the mean water use of the trees, which is just the fractional cover of trees times the individual water use of each tree and similar terms for grass and for bare ground. And we say that the expectation value, the average of that quantity, must be constrained by the given water availability that we have. And that acts as a constraint on the probability distribution that we want to construct. We want to construct what's the probability that that given savanna site has a given fractional cover, uh, like 60% trees, 30% grass cover, and 10% bare ground. And we're going to use maximum entropy to construct that distribution uh, using exactly the same laws of, of coin tossing uh, that I uh, showed in the introduction. Um, so it's um, maximizing the Shannon entropy of that distribution subject to that constraint. And um, I don't know if there's any f physicists in, in the audience, but there is actually a, a nice way of picturing the state of a savanna in terms of this picture of, of levels of, of water use. So what we've got is a hierarchy of water use um, that um, from bare ground at the lowest water use to patches covered by grass, which have higher water use, to patches govern, uh, covered by trees, which is the highest water use. And we can represent the particular mix of uh, ground cover by specifying the number of patches of a given cover type. That's the red blobs. So in this particular case, there are five patches which are bare ground, uh, three patches covered by grass, and one patch covered by, governed by trees, covered by trees. And there's an, anal an analogy between these levels and atomic energy levels in physics. And um, amusingly, uh, f physicists um, talk about the lowest energy level as being the ground state. Um, and in ecology, of course, this is precisely what we're talking about because this is bare ground. So finally, physicists and ecologists using the same lang language. So that's kind of encouraging. Um, so I'll use that as a, as, as a handy way of picturing the state of a savanna site. Um, and here's what we predict from maximum entropy. So we, we're graphing the... Um, uh, ra rainfall or um, water availability on the x-axis and in the top panel we're looking at the fraction of uh, um, the savanna site covered by trees and in the middle panel the fraction covered by grass and in the bottom the complement of bare ground and each of those brown dots is a um, an observation from the MODIS satellite um, and the blue curves are the essentially the uh, percentiles of the predicted maximum entropy distribution for those different tree cover types. So what you see is that um, as you increase water availab availability, the fractional tree cover is observed to increase. And this is indeed what's predicted by the blue curves. Um, we also capture the variability in the tree cover for any given water availability. So we're going from the 5% to the 95% percentiles who capture not just the mean trend but the variability about that, that trend. The middle panel uh, shows that the observed grass cover increases with water availability uh, but then subsequently decreases as it's outcompeted by trees and we capture that trend also with the, the blue curves from maximum entropy and the complement is, is bare ground and at the bottom the red uh, dots um, just signify that if in, in arid um, conditions the maximum entropy distribution shows that the savanna site will be dominated by bare ground, so all the red dots are in the lowest ground state. Okay? Um, in the middle we have a sort of uniform 
maximum diversity situation where we've got an equal occupancy by trees, grasses and bare grounds. And then at high water availability we have the system dominated by the species with the highest water use, that's, that's the trees. So we get the, the, the red dots kind of uh, going from the, the bottom level to the, the top level. Um, so with very little kind of um, assumption, uh, assumptions on uh, the biological assumptions, we're able to capture the, tre the patterns and diversity um, across a gradient from rainfall. And the key thing to note is that we capture this variability without modeling explicitly the disturbances of fire and herbivory. And the idea you need to understand is that we're not denying that fire and herbivory are, are important in producing this variance. All we are saying is that we do not need to model them explicitly to capture, to predict that pattern. We can treat them as essentially random noise. Um, that's uh, the key thing there. Um, though we, s we can um, see that there are certain things we do not capture, like in the top um, panel for fractional tree cover, there's a sort of gap um, in the uh, density of brown points at around 1200 millimeters per year um, uh, at about 70 percent tree cover, that sort of less dense area there, and um, we cannot capture that uh, with the maximum entropy distribution. The mismatch between the maximum entropy distribution of tree cover and the observed tree cover, according to our logic, signals that we are missing a constraint. Um, and in that particular case, it could be that we do, in fact, in that case, need to model fire and herbivory as more than just random noise in order to capture that, uh, that effect there. Okay. Um, in the um, remainder, I want to just um, say that in, in order to, uh, to tackle the, the remaining two questions about the relationship between diversity, productivity, and stability, we simply generalize the savanna model to... Um, more than two vegetation uh, cover types. Um, so rather than just trees and grasses and bare ground, we can have um, a, a, a any number of possible species. Um, but it's just exactly the same logic uh, that we use to predict uh, the coexistence of these species, the most likely pattern. Um, so in this particular case, we were trying, if you recall, to explain why we get two contrasting patterns between the relationship between diversity and the resource availability or productivity of, of, of ecosystems, one unimodal and the other monotonic. Um, we predicted the unimodal um, uh, pattern as essentially the savanna model extended. That's to say when the resource availability is very small, the community is dominated by that species which has the, the, the smallest resource use per capita. Uh, so that's like bare ground in the savanna model. But here um, it's simply the lowest, um, uh, the, the species with the, the smallest end demand, nitrogen demand. So that's, and then at high water, uh, well, high nitrogen availability, uh, the community is predicted to be dominated by the species with the, the largest resource uh, use per capita. Um, that's analogous to the, the trees being dominant in high water availability in the savanna. And in the middle, there's a sort of um, uh, equally diverse distribution of, um, uh, of types represented in, in the model. So that's the, the peak in the diversity versus uh, nitrogen supply curve. And we predict that that peak occurs uh, at, a, at a value of, of nitrogen supply which is close to what, what is actually observed. And um, the key point in explaining this diversity pattern, why is there a maximum, is that um, there are only 26 possible species that have been introduced into this experiment. Okay, so there are only 26 levels in the um, in, in, the, in the picture there, so that this, as you increase the, the resource supply, um, the system will eventually hit the ceiling. You can't go any higher than the top, top level. And so eventually you'll, you'll get a system which is dominated by that top level species, a, a low diversity outcome. So we'll always get a, a peak um, be at low and high um, end supply. In contrast, we can explain the monotonic uh, relationship between species number and community resource use. If we 
assume that now there, we are not confined to 26 species, but we assume that over long periods of time speciation can occur, for example. So in fact there's a potential and infinite hierarchy of species we could en envisage. Uh, we lift the ceiling off the system, if you like, and so as we uh, add more resources, um, the red dots simply populate higher and higher levels. There's no ceiling. Okay, so the, the, the number of species um, that are occupied by red dots just continues to increase and increase. Um, that's the essential difference that allows us to explain with the same model why in the one hand we have a unimodal relationship and on the other uh, monotonic. It's simply that the spectrum of possible species is either finite or infinite. Um, walk past that one. The um, final um, pattern that we were interested in explaining was to uh, uh, the relationship between diversity and stability of ecosystems. And I'll recall that on the one hand, if you take the stability of a given species within a community, as you increase the number of competitors, the stability of any given species um, de declines. It becomes more unstable. Um, that's that general kind of trend. Um, in contrast, the biomass of the community as a whole becomes more stable as the number of species increases. And that's that general trend in the, the solid line there. How do we reconcile these two um, uh, contrasting patterns? Well, attempts have been made to, to do just that by introducing some ad hoc assumptions uh, which relate, uh, say, the variance of the biomass of a given species I and the mean uh, biomass of a given species I. Tillman assumed that there was some kind of power law relationship between the variance and the mean biomass of a given species with an exponent um, that between one and two. No, no justification, but if, if you assume that and if you assume that there are the biomass fluctuations of, of two different species are uncorrelated uh, which is not really the case because if you remove one species you can increase another species but in any case you, you'd ignore those, those covariances and if you assume that all uh, species are equally abundant on average uh, which amounts to ignoring any functional differences between species so if you assume all those things then it turns out you can explain these two patterns Okay, but the question is: This is this is a sort of ad hoc, uh, tailored explanation that that forces the the answer. Um, can we explain these two patterns from another perspective? Well, we we did this using maximum entropy, using the same model as I showed you before, um, and in this case, uh, maximum entropy uh, predicts what the species mixtures should be in a in a community. And maximum entropy predicts that as you increase the number of species in a community, the um, variance in the abundance of a, a given species within that community becomes larger, so that each species becomes more unstable in terms of its abundance or its, its biomass. And that's shown by the general upward trend in the clouds of points going from left to right in the bottom curve. And what you're seeing in any given uh, example here. Here's a community with 15 species and maximum entry uh, predicts that the, there is a range of um, uh, stabilities um, in which the, the least abundant um, uh, species in that community has, uh, the, the, is the most stable and the, uh, the, the, the dominant species um, has the greatest instability. So we have this, this general cloud of points which is um, qualitatively at least consistent with the general trend in um, more instability of a given species if you add competitors. Um, this comes out just from the, the mathematics of the maximum entropy solution. Um, in contrast, uh, we want to look at the community level stability and in order to quantify that, uh, community ecologists um, look at the total number of vegetation patches in a community. That's the, that's the, uh, the, the component not um, occupied by bare ground. And one can then count the, uh, the variance of um, 
that number of patches and can de decompose that into um, uh, a variance and a covariance, a V and a C. Uh, that's just the mathematics of, of, of variance. And then one can quantify the instability of the uh, um, vegetative component of, of a whole entire community as the ratio of the, the variance of that um, uh, vegetation community to the, to the mean number of uh, vegetation patches and that can be composed into the, uh, the variance, the covariance and the, the mean. And in, in other words we can interpret changes in the instability of, or stability of, of uh, vegetation in the community as a whole in terms of these three components which ecologists have uh, uh, given fancy names like portfolio effect compensatory dynamics and over yielding, but they're simply just the mathematical components that define the, the relative stability of the community as a whole. And um, these were what we showed in uh, Tillman's plot earlier. So the, um, the uh, open uh, diamonds are the variance, the open circles are the covariance components, and the net variance is the sum of the two uh, shown in the black curve. And we saw the trend, um, uh, the trends in these three components uh, shown there as a function of species richness. Uh, maximum entropy uh, pr makes predictions for each of these components. It shows, in fact, the portfolio effect as a decline in the, in the variance um, uh, with added, added species. Um, it shows um, the compensatory dynamics, which reflects the covariance uh, between the abundance of different species as, as a negative number which, which rises. Why is it negative? Because if I increase the abundance of one species, I must decrease the abundance of, of another species. Um, and the net effect, though they're in the red curve, is a, a general decline in the net variance, uh, covariance of, um, of the community as a whole. In other words, the community as a whole becomes more stable the more species uh, that are in that community. So the general patterns are predicted um, at the community level and at the, the population level and maximum entropy predicts why they are different uh, without these extra assumptions that Tillman had used. Um, I'll sp um, pass on that. The final um, result which I find is quite intriguing because it comes back to the whole point that we can learn about ecological systems from what we know about physical systems. Um, maximum en entropy model that I just used to predict these patterns also predicts something quite odd um, and surprising is that when you decrease say the water availability of a system um, so from left uh, uh, a, a wet tropical forest down to a very arid savanna you expect, like in the savanna model, that there would be a gentle decline in the uh, tree fraction, okay? Um, but when you, it turns out when you consider a, a generalized model with many more species than just trees and grasses, something very surprising happens. What happens is that as, as you increase, as you decrease the water availability, the system, uh, which is very rich in vegetation, uh, changes gradually its species mixtures, okay, but it's still dominated by, by vegetation with no bare ground. And then at some critical water availability, bare ground suddenly starts appearing and the vegetation suddenly starts disappearing. So there's a, there's a, a critical tipping point. And let me show you that in this graph here. So what we're showing is on the vertical axis, the uh, the vegetation fraction, that's the fraction of our uh, community which is covered by vegetation, the complement being bare ground. And you see that in, in the horizontal axis is basically a measure of how wet or dry the system is. So on the left, the wettest sites here, we have 100% occupancy by vegetation. And um, this essentially uh, uh, continues as we dry the site uh, out until suddenly at some critical water availability, the fraction covered by vegetation starts to decline rapidly and bare ground starts to dominate. So it's very curious that it's not a gradual decline, but it's a kind of critical threshold. Um, so in terms of the pictures of red, red blobs here, we start at the left with a, a, a community dominated by the, 
uh, the species with the highest water demand per capita, so that would be trees in the savanna. And then as we dry it out, these red uh, dots kind of redistribute amongst the vegetation, so the, the composition of species within the vegetation component uh, changes, but we still have no bare ground component, so the, the bottom level is, is empty. And then suddenly, everything falls into the ground state. Everything become very rapidly becomes bare ground um, until we get to the, the arid. Um, uh, associated with this uh, sudden change in the vegetation fraction is uh, fluctuations uh, at this critical point, that the fluctuations in, in the abundance of the vegetation are very large at this critical point. Um, so the, 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 although the vegetation is occupying 100% on average, there are great fluctuations. And this is another signal of, of tipping points in, in general in ecological systems. Um, so we get this peak in the variance uh, of um, the, the, the community water use um, as the mean water use declines. Um, to a physicist, this is all very familiar, however. Um, to, a, to an ecologist, it might might be surprising you get such a critical threshold. If you pick up a textbook on quantum mechanics and physics and read about um, Mr. Bose and Mr. Einstein, you'll discover that there's this critical threshold phenomenon uh, called the Bose-Einstein condensation, which is uh, an anal analogous transition of a system of atoms occupying energy levels in which as you cool the system down to very low temperatures, suddenly all the atoms collapse into the ground state. And in quantum mechanics, the ground state has some very peculiar properties uh, which um, explain superfluid zero resistance flow in very cold fluids like helium or superconductivity in uh, electrical uh, conductors. Here we have the exact mathematical ana analog of that, but obviously without any quantum mechanical explanation. The explanation is simply that the, the statistical laws, the, the laws of chance governing atoms distributed amongst energy levels is exactly analogous to the laws of chance governing species in uh, a community of um, different species gov um, distinguished by different water use availability. So we have an exact um, analog um, between these two rather different phenomena. Okay, so in summary... Um, uh, yeah, so um, the y-axis is, um, well, uh, I've plotted two things. So the, the, uh, the this is probably the variance, um, so this is this, this curve here, and um, I, at the same time I've plotted the, what's happening to the mean uh, community water use. So I'm just going from, from wet here, that's high water availability, to low, and I'm showing that, um, of course, the mean water use by the community is constrained to, to equal that, but the variance, which reflects the variance in the abundances, um, has a sharp peak, so you get lots of fluctuations um, as you go through that transition. So don't worry too much about the units because I'm plotting two different things on the same graph. Um, so what do we learn from this? Um, we learn that maximum entropy is a, a tool which is essentially just the laws of chance. What, uh, it, it, explain, it explains uh, emergent patterns of diversity as essentially th the most likely uh, patterns you would observe in a, an ecological community under given constraints using exactly the same logic as coin tossing. Um, it appears to explain and synthesize several contrasting patterns of diversity in ecological communities uh, with only a f by invoking only a few ecological constraints like the amount of water available and the amount of space but without having to model explicitly processes like fire and herbivory directly, they can be treated essentially as random noise. But I would like to um, highlight maximum entropy, uh, what it cannot do. Uh, what it can do is explain the, the large-scale frequency distribution of properties of, of savannas, for example. But if you ask me to explain why for this particular savanna site there are 60% trees, 30% grass, and 10% bare ground, 
Uh, I can't explain that site-specific observation without knowing the disturbance history of that particular site. So I'm not, compl I'm not saying that maximum entropy will explain everything and um, you've been wasting your time discuss uh, um, um, studying fire and herbivory and, and these uh, interesting sort of um, processes. I'm just asking a, a different question than, than you are. I'm looking at the, the long, the large scale average behavior of, of systems. And I guess the overall message I want you to get from this is that there are um, tools and concepts from physics, um, results from physics, which um, have interesting analogues um, with ecology that allow us to gain new insights into the behavior of uh, ecological communities and the rules of assembly. Um, and I think it's an ex exciting way to cross fertilize ideas between different disciplines. So thank you. Model, you have this patch with plants, shrubs. Yeah. That applies to animals as well? Yes, it does. And um, uh, another group in, um, in California, led by John Hart and Ber at Berkeley, have applied these sort of ideas uh, to animal communities too, because the underlying logic of the laws of chance uh, apply equally to any type of ind individuals. Uh, where you um, distinguish the different species of animals by, say, their metabolic rates or their, their, res their uh, resource uses. So um, there are um, uh, patterns of diversity in, in animals that have been explained using the same, same logic. It's not, uh, it's not specific to plants. That was just my, my particular interest in uh, uh, but it's, it's, it's a lot more gen generic simply because the, the logic, the underlying logic of uh, the laws of chance are, are more generic than, than plants. So I have a question on this last model, looking at the relationship between vegetation cover and water availability or rainfall. So you here, you're not adding any additional constraint relative to the initial model you explained, other than you have more levels, more species that can occupy space. That so compared, comparing this with the savanna model, you mean? Or? Yes, yes, with the savanna model. Yes. yes, so I'm just simply saying that instead of the savanna model, which is bare ground, grass and trees, I could have several species of, uh, you know, more functional types yeah. than just two, these yeah, two. The so the, the question is, um, Normally, people explain this type of threshold behavior resorting to positive interactions between plants, no? these uh, positive feedbacks. So how does, how does it relate to your uh, explanation? So you, you are saying basically that we don't need this process to explain this pattern. Or, or how does it relate? To yeah, that, that's, to that's an interesting question. What is the interpretation of, the, of this? Um, it's, uh, first of all, there is no, uh, we, we don't model those interactions and th those feedbacks, and, and yet we, we produce this threshold behavior. Uh, the interpretation might be that, um, yes, those positive interactions are uh, fundamentally required to create that, that threshold behavior, but we don't need to uh, model those interactions explicitly. We can treat them as random noise in, in this approach um, in the same way that you know you could explain the, the that you observe 50 percent heads and 50 percent tails in a long throw of a uh, long series of coin tosses by a, a, a fantastically detailed model of, the, of, every, of every, every throw but you could treat those details as random noise and get the same answer um, so I, I guess um, the 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 real insight from maximum entropy is to um, identify what are the key determinants that you need to model explicitly, the necessity, and what are the mechanistic details that, although you don't deny their existence, 
uh, you can treat effectively as random noise. Yeah, this is related with your answer, but in this model, in this statistical model, is considering 100,000 species? Uh, in principle, 100,000 potential, potential. potential species, but only a fraction of those will actually be uh, realized in the community. And that may be important, for instance, for, for this uh, feedback interpretation, in the sense that maybe we move to a shorter number of species than the statistics. Uh, well, this behavior is improved by this feedback, for instance? It, it could well be the case. Um, so if you look at a, a smaller number of species, uh, like the savannah model, mm -hmm. of course you don't see that threshold. We just saw a, 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 a continuous decline in, in the cover fraction of trees and grasses. Uh, this threshold behavior is a property of model when you have many potential species, so it's an important distinguish yeah, distinction. I think that's something to, uh, yeah. to think the about also because the, I would like to understand more the, this, uh, this random noise in the, in the statistics to produce this, uh, this kind of, um, of condensation. Yes, <laughs> that's system. exactly what it is. No, yeah. it the, the, the yeah. right but, but I have another question that in your model you are considering uh, distinct entities. In the case of a species, more or less it is right, more or less, but you mm -hmm. can but in the case of the vegetation, uh, maybe in your in your example of uh, of uh, savanna and forest is right because it's more or less self-maintaining by this kind of feedbacks. But in mm -hmm. many cases in the vegetation, what you have is that your entity, your type, your category is moving, is transforming to the other one through time. Uh -huh. And and maybe that that that's important because you are you are assuming that time here is just noise. In some, in some way, that connect your approach mm. to, the, to the dynamic systems modeling. In fact, that they produce this kind of, of cows and attractors, mm. and what you have is like a slice of this attractor that has this probability uh, approach. But um, what is time here? Okay, so uh, when we, it's a very good question, uh, w when we apply the um, balance constraint between water availability and, and community water use. We're interpreting this as a balance between the long-term average, yeah. okay? So the probability distribution that we are predicting, uh, what does it mean? It's the a fraction of time the system would uh, spend over time in a given ecological state. Uh, we don't predict the dynamic transitions from one year to the other, we only predict the statistical result of a long sequence of, uh, so the time is not explicit. Yeah, I, I, I finally understood that, yeah. but then the, my, this, this approach to, to include the time into the interpretation of the ecological uh, behavior and also the, the physical, mm. well I know that both also get compensated. Mm -hmm. the approach, but anyway, that, that our scale of living is, uh, is relevant. Um, but there is also this other, this other <coughs> another contribution of time in the sense that some of the entities are, are transforming. Even evo in evolution, the species are, are not constant. And yeah. In fact, all, all thinking about the species also changing. We use species as uh, you know, practical, practical, yeah. uh, practical use. But yeah. this idea that the entities may change each other. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, something to... Yeah, to, uh, so to answer that I would say that maybe using the word species in the context of this model is a little bit uh, um, biased. What I would say is that um, th these are functional types. So I, we do, the only thing that distinguishes what we call species is the water use. So I could consider that the water use um, of this uh, functional type is less than this, but this could be the same individual. This could be the same individual as uh, this, but just a bigger, same species as this, but just a bigger individual. So uh, we can consider that uh, uh, even an individual plant, which one year uses very little water and one year uses a, a, a large amount of water, can actually be considered to be a different functional type in, in this. So I would, uh, I think it's important to realize that we're actually talking about f functional types rather than species. So we... I, I, I also had this doubt on, on time, but, uh, but let's, uh, let's change gears. 
uh, you have talked about changes, uh, chance, mm -hmm. mobility, and then, but what is really interesting for our society, at least the, both the scientific and, 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 and the outside society, is the constraints. Mm -hmm. So, uh, let, let's say, I don't understand well, I don't see it uh, clear, how do you introduce in your models the constraints of matter, energy, and space? Mm -hmm. So, which is the role relative to this randomness? Okay, so it... Um, and and, the, and the, another question, yeah, no, to avoid being too long, mm -hmm. is please explain, explain us how do, you, uh, how do you introduce in your models maximum entropy? So which variables are you using to okay. calculate maximum entropy? So if I can find a slide that tries to answer these questions... Um, I, I, I tell you yeah. that because our society, for example, now is not as well of these constraints. This is a very, very hot topic. So oh. to, have you, to have the constraints in our mind, okay. it, it helps us a lot to understand how life is in this world. Yeah, so uh, here's the constraints of space. We're just, con by defining our, the extent of our, uh, our system, we have, we have a, a certain number of patches. Um, and so this, the sum of the number of these patches is, is a fixed quantity. Um, in terms of the constraint of mass balance, we are, uh, this is uh, an input to the model that defines the water availability, uh, mean annual water availability of the, of the system. And the constraint consists of saying that in the long term this will be equal to the mean w water use by the community. So it's a constraint in the, in the sense that it's um, at once a, a mass balance between inputs and outputs, but also a constraint in that we can make this number consider th this being small, or like an arid communi uh, community, or, or large, so that we're, we're then looking at, uh, uh, ch so if we change the constraints of water availability, so for example if the climate becomes drier, mm -hmm. we can consider the effect on biodiversity in the model by decreasing this, the, this number here. And then the, the um, so uh, we haven't got energy in here um, simply because we, we played the game of what's the minimum number of constraints we need to put in to the model to explain the observed frequency distributions of, of grass tree coexistence. Um, where do the, 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 does that answer the questions in terms of constraints? And where do we introduce maximum entropy? It's simply that um, mathematically, we, um, um, where do I get, um, we, um, in the savannah, uh, so that we, we maximize this Shannon entropy with respect to the probability distribution, PI, so uh, I is your outcome, so in this case it's the fractional cover of trees or grasses, and we constrain, we constrain the, the, the maximization uh, so that the, the expectation values of, of the community water use, uh, where you calculate the average with respect to the, the PI, is this given number E. So it's a constrained optimization problem where you, you're, you're, opt you're, you're, opt you're maximizing H with respect, with respect to PI, subject to that constraint on the average community water use. So it's, it, you, it's actually quite a simple mathematical problem to to put together. I, I didn't want to spell that out in great detail, but it's actually not a very, mathematically, it's a very simple procedure um, to put together. I, I see mathematical matter. I, I, wonder, <laughs> I wonder whether it, it was uh, re reflecting the, the nature. Oh, I see, yeah, okay. Yeah. Hopefully, <laughs> but. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Danny, this, uh, the forest cover distribution of the, the aridity gradient is also affected by for example, CO2. So the water use efficiency comes in somehow. How do you, how can you account for such mechanisms in this uh, so in this particular example, we didn't include a, a CO2 effect because we were looking just to explain the the observed um, uh, mixture of trees and, and grasses across that aridity gradient. Um, the, that's the next stage, if you like. So all we did was we assumed very naively that 
all tree individuals transpire the same amount of water and all grass individuals transpire uh, a slightly smaller. Um, that's completely naive, of course. Um, so in order to address the question of how CO2 would change uh, species of mudances, we would replace that very simple model by a physiological model which would uh, predict how tree water use would vary with CO2. Um, so the, 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 but the logic would, would apply in the same way. Okay. This example of the bare ground and the cover, it seems that the, the result uh, is affected by the way you define the, the states. Because you may, have, you may have cover with one leaf, two leaves, or, or larger amount of leaves. And, uh, and on the other, and, and another point of view, you may have not cover above ground, but you may have roots below ground. Then the definition of bear and cover, it's, it's like a two states, mm. but you can define it another way. And I wonder if changing the way you look at, at the, in this case, the ecosystem, uh, you still keep with the result of the first, with the threshold result. Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, I, I think just to answer the, the, la the last part, um, uh, we, ha we haven't, change the description to see what the effect w would be on the threshold but my my intuition would be that that threshold behavior is is generic uh, to this this kind of model where you uh, as long as you're distinguishing functional types by the water use uh, then you will get this phenomenon um, I guess you're we we've taken a look a cartoon version of of these different functional types and where you're talking about um, distinguishing between trees with small amount of leaf area and large amount of leaf area I, I guess we as I said from, a, from an answer to a previous question we might represent that difference by uh, another functional type you know with, with, with more leaves you have greater water use for that, that individual, uh, so a small plant versus a large plant, we, we could actually consider as a different functional type. Um, what we would like to do, and it relates to the CO2 question, is to, to replace that very naive uh, representation of functional types by physiological models which calculate the water use of a, an individual as a function of the plant traits. So it could be root, roots and number of leaves. And th this is exciting because it will then provide a way to relate community level macroecological patterns to individual level physiology. Uh, and that's a sort of br an, an interesting bridge. So that what you're talking about is essentially the, the next stage in our development of these models is to, um, to make the, the, the water use model uh, re relate that to to these plant traits and um, connect with, uh, make that um, enable us to address those climate change issues, which um, at this stage we're we're not addressing. Well, that was excellent with this final hint at uh, what is to come. Mm -hmm. But I think we ought to thank uh, Rodi again for the wonderful talk. Thank you.